This week, Benedict Evans, a 20-year veteran of A16Z, gave a memorable presentation in Singapore called AI Eats the World. My executive briefing this week is going to be focused on what he's talking about, why we need to pay attention, and what the implications are for all of us who are building and leading AI teams. Let's get right to it. So first, who's Benedict? So he, he has been a tech strategist for the last 20 years, specifically focused on platform shifts, which makes him perfectly positioned to think about what AI means strategically. So he's been involved in PCs, the web, smartphones, social, and of course now AI. His job is to think about how these shifts change power margins and industry structures. So he's not selling you an AI product in this presentation. He's trying to be a macro translator between the hype and the PL statement. So he's useful as a sanity anchor in a world that loves hype. The setting is Super AI Singapore 2025, and he is talking to senior leaders, right? CTOs, investors who are asking themselves, is AI a bubble? Is AI just the next software cycle? Is this the moment when everything we know about software economics breaks? So what did he talk about? This is 90 slides. I'm going to get it into just a few minutes for you, and then we're going to start to look at strategic takeaways that I pulled out and what I think it means for all of us. First, Ben talked about AI as a moving target. AI used to mean databases, then it meant search, then it meant classical machine learning. Once it works, we stop calling it AI. I love that insight. So today, large language models and generative models are wearing that label, but other stuff people are forgetting that it's AI because it works. When you think about it that way, you start to realize how deep the roots of this technical transition are and how much of our adoption curve is driven by novelty. Ben also talked about the platform cycle frame, the idea that we are moving through predictable wave patterns even as AI is a novel technology. But these novel technologies have predictable patterns that AI is following. So we've moved from mainframes to PCs to web to smartphones and now to AI. Every wave attracts massive investment at first. It reshapes who are the winners and who are the losers. But this is the critical point. It rarely deletes previous layers. I loved that takeaway because it's fractal. That takeaway works both for the larger insight that like I have a smartphone now and also a laptop. But also in the world of AI, the newest tools that are coming out in 2025 are rarely deleting the base tools. We are getting new tools for 3D models. We are getting new tools for vision. We are not deleting chat GPT. So the idea that like you can have massive investment and in reshape winners and not delete previous layers seems very powerful to me. On the CapEx side, Ben pointed out, that yes, big tech is spending hundreds of billions, if not trillions on data centers and GPUs. And at the same time, more and more labs are grabbing onto proliferating AI technology so that they can train good enough models. The net effect is that the model itself is looking like a commodity input. And we have talked about that a fair bit on this newsletter. You should not be surprised to hear that. The model is not a moat. I will add a caveat that Ben didn't talk about a ton. One of the other papers that came out this week was a deep study on Chinese open source models. And one of the things it concluded is that the flexible intelligence of these models taken in aggregate across Quen and many others is less clear, less effective, less generally flexible than the intelligence of American-made models. And that may be because it's not quantized effectively or distilled down effectively, but the general conclusion of the paper is that Chinese models are heavily reliant on US frontier models and distilling those down to get to open source models that they can release to the world. And in a sense, what the paper suggested is that the pace of innovation is still being driven by private models developed by frontier labs in the United States, and the rest of the world is following suit and pulling distillations out of those models that may be good for some use cases, but are not as generally intelligent and are not appropriate for cutting edge uses. Within that context, right, Ben's statement needs some nuance because I would argue that the methodologies used by the cutting edge labs are defensible and certainly their edge is defensible. And so no one is going to join the table of top model makers, which frankly, at this point, we've even lost folks in the last year. Meta is not a top model maker anymore. Grok is trying to be, but isn't leading anything right now. The top model makers are Anthropic, Google, and OpenAI. 
That's it. And so in a sense, the model may become a commodity, intelligence may be in everything, and yet we still may have cutting edge moats. Let's move on to what else Ben talked about. One of the things he called out that we'll talk a fair bit about here is the adoption gap. Lots of people and companies have tried AI, but Ben made the point that far fewer use it daily in core workflows. I keep pounding this drum. The difference between casual chat GPT users and passionate professionals is night and day 10x. And this is critical for teams because one person on your team, two people on your teams who are an eight or a nine or a 10 in terms of their AI skill sets out of 10, they are going to run circles around everyone else. And so the blockers to adoption, the blockers to moving people that way are really around motivation, the ability to understand what these models can do. And then on the corporate side, how do you get them integrated? How do you handle governance and risk? And how do you roll them out? One of the things that Andre Carpathy talked about this week on X that Ben didn't mention because it hadn't happened yet, is he talked about this idea that we need to be able to imagine LLMs as non-animal alien intelligences at a high degree of fidelity so that we can understand how to work with them. Effectively, what he's saying is we are as a species having our first contact with a new intelligence. And the better we can build a mental model of what that intelligence looks like and how it works, the more effectively we can partner together. This is not a like scary doomsday first contact movie. It's more about imagining how the intelligence works, helps us to prompt better, work better, collaborate better, all the boring stuff that's really important. And this is something that Ben didn't get into, but I think is really important. Having that imagination, that aha moment in your teams is critical to enabling outsized leverage, outsized impact for the team. So that was the heart of his message. That's what he talked about. That's 90 slides in just a few minutes. What are the deeper takeaways here? Number one, I think we've quietly crossed from miracle to inevitable utility. So this is much more subtle than a commoditization argument. I think Evan's talk marks a tipping point. AI is no longer being framed in most settings as will this work? Will we get there? Instead, it's being framed as obviously this works. Where does the margin end up? Where do the winners end up? That's especially true and top of mind this week when we saw visual reasoning solved with Nano Banana Pro, when we saw Meta's SAM 3 model drop and handle semantic search for video. We have these previously difficult spaces where we're seeing AI just works. And then we have confirmation from Google that Gemini 3 didn't have special tricks up its sleeve. It was classical pre-training and post-training LLMs. There is no wall on training. You can just get bigger and better and train the same way you always have and get a smarter model. That may sound like a banal observation, but knowing that that's true and seeing the breakthroughs that we've had, we now are just living in a world where this is inevitable. AI is going to be everywhere. AI has already solved enough problems to let us know that the scaling laws hold. And if we assume it's everywhere, we need to ask a different set of questions. Where do we matter? Where do our companies matter? How do we set up ourselves as competitive players in this space? Those are becoming the relevant questions. And so the strategic risk isn't sort of missing the AI moment. It's really continuing to act as if this is a tunable or optional research and development play instead of this is inevitable infrastructure. And if you don't go after it with every tool you've got, you're just not going to make it. A smarter question to ask in that world is if AI is as inevitable as spreadsheets have become, what parts of our value chain become just a feature in that world and are no longer competitive? That's a tight, interesting question to play with. Deep takeaway number two, adoption isn't just slow, it is path dependent and it can trap you. So adoption is lumpy. Evans pointed that out. Lots of pilots, not a lot of deep usage. Some people use it a lot. Whether and where you choose to adopt shapes what becomes possible later. And he didn't talk about that, but think about spreadsheets. The first teams that adopted them weren't just more efficient. They reorganized how information flowed through the business. They could model scenarios. They owned the numbers. They could self-serve. LLMs and agents are poised to do the same. So the pattern is going to be you drop AI into one or two workflows. Those workflows shift how information is produced. They shift how it's consumed. And that in turn shifts which other workflows are now possible. So the non-obvious leadership problem for you is if adoption is path dependent, 
Are we choosing the right beachheads? I talk a lot about problem framing, about picking the right places to jump in with AI. And that's really the question in front of us as we confront an adoption challenge in our teams. Recent model evolution makes this an even sharper problem. Agent native models, Gemini class, et cetera, aren't just better autocomplete, right? They're, they're suited to many kinds of work, meaningful work, knowledge work, triage, coordination, follow-up, repetitive decision loops with clear constraints. If your first experiments are all summarize this doc, you're never going to discover the compounding benefit of agent-assisted customer onboarding or agent-assisted engineering support. Essentially, the beachhead you picked constrains some of your paths forward. So where should we try AI is not a random sandbox question for a Friday afternoon. It is a path design question. In other words, you you will get compounding benefits or compounding costs depending on which workflows you choose. So look where there are important junctions in your organization's information flow patterns and jump in there. Because when you can create a change in that flow, you unlock a lot of downstream benefits. You unlock a lot of opportunity to use AI agents elsewhere. Non-obvious takeaway number three, AI is gonna turn you into a buyer with additional leverage if you design for it. So Evan's commoditization story has a second order effect that most people aren't talking about. As models get closer to parity and quality, as you get more model options, your power is going to increase as a purchaser of models as long as you structure for that effectively. Enterprise AI conversations still turn too often on vendor lock-in. I have screamed about this a lot. I'm going to say it again. Don't say we're an X model shop. Just be multi-model from the get-go. If you take Evan seriously, if you take me seriously, the long-term equilibrium is going to look like treating models as components and routing your workloads to different models based on the cost, the latency, the data sensitivity, the jurisdiction, et cetera. That's not the reality in most of our orgs today. It is something we need to get to. So the non-obvious implication is don't think about picking a winner model or even a winner lab. Instead, think about building an architecture that lets you be in the driver's seat and buyer's conversations and lets you arbitrage models the way you want over time. Don't settle for lock-in. Deeper takeaway number four, AI is eating the org chart, not just the tech stack. And it's not about layoffs. So Evans focuses on tech cycles, but if you extend his logic, spreadsheets didn't just change software, they changed who needed to talk to whom. What roles become bottlenecks? Which functions gained political power like finance and operations? Cloud. Cloud didn't just move servers off premises. It shifted power from central IT to product and engineering. It accelerated the pace at which teams could experiment. AI will do the same for roles that are around coordination, for roles that are around synthesis versus roles that are mostly judgment and constraint setting. So recent agent style capabilities make this more concrete. A model that can read your email, Slack, tickets, dashboards, you, you name it, right? And propose actions is effectively an informal chief of staff for every knowledge worker. And we should expect that by 2026. That doesn't just increase individual productivity. It changes who needs an assistant, who needs a team, where the bottlenecks in decision-making live. And so the non-obvious implication for you as a leader is if you only think of AI as a tool rollout, you will miss that you are doing an org design change at the same time. Some roles will shift from doing work to specifying, to checking, to escalating that work. Other roles will shrink because the coordination overhead they manage gets automated away. So your span of control assumptions, your management layers, your hiring plans are all gonna need to adopt much adapt much faster than in previous cycles. So Evan is giving you the technical story here, but I think we need to extend that out to the org store. So where does this leave us? I wanna to suggest to you, especially at the end of one of the most jaw-dropping weeks I can remember in AI, that we need to be taking a step back regularly as leaders and we need to be asking ourselves when we have weeks like this where i can't name the number of significant developments we had i've attempted to it's like half a dozen or so over the course of the week we need to say does any of this change the strategic operating reality of the business that i am building and i think evan's matrix evan's talk ai eats the world gives us a good framework for that because it enables us to say, okay, is there something that is shifting the tech adoption cycle here? Is there something that is shifting my org chart here? Is there something about how information flows in my business that is changing? Is there something about my vendor relationships and my power with vendors that is shifting because of this unlock? And the answer, if we ask, is often yes, but having the right questions to ask helps put us in the driver's seat during times when the news cycle feels relentless on AI 
And I got to say, that's not going to stop. And so my encouragement to you, if you're feeling overwhelmed and you're trying to think about how to sort all of this out is make a regular practice of stepping back and looking at the world like Evans does. Take a day, step back, get a whiteboard out. Maybe you get your senior team together or just go for a walk in the woods and figure out what this means for your business. Distill it down, take your time, because that time to reflect is what is going to enable you to digest, synthesize, and form core conviction that you need to push your teams forward. A lot of what I'm talking about here is really the meat of where leadership and understanding of AI meets the road, where you need to be at with your teams to drive them forward. And you can't do that if you don't have energy and conviction. And that comes from having the ability to reset, digest and synthesize all of these updates effectively, and then come back with fresh energy. So take that into the week and uh, I'll see you next week.